Good evening. My name's uh, Gary Wensky, and I'm the executive director of the Frank Church Institute. <laughs> Welcome to the Frank and Bethine Church Award for Public Service. This year's award dinner is held in conjunction with the 32nd Annual Frank Church Conference, Clash of Cultures, the Middle East and Turmoil. Many of you attended the conference sessions last Friday, which featured a number of distinguished speakers, including both current and former foreign policy officials. If you missed them, the sessions are online at frankchurchinstitute.boisestate.edu. Please join me in thanking our media sponsors this evening, the Idaho Statesman, Idaho Public Television, and Boise State Public Radio. Also, let me ask the Board of Directors of the Frank Church Institute to stand and be thanked for their support of the Frank Church conferences, as well as the Frank Church Scholarships and the Frank Church and Bethine Church Chair of Public Affairs. Please stand, all the board members. And I want to extend a special thanks to our board member, Rick Clausen, a former Frank Church staff member, and his wife, Amy, for underwriting tonight's award recipient. Please. We have a number of distinguished guests tonight, so at, at my own peril, I'll introduce a few of them and, and the rest of you will be <laughs> uh, uh, passed over, I'm afraid. <laughs> First, our, our own cabinet secretary, Governor Cecil Andrews, please. And we have Idaho Attorney General Lawrence Wasden here. And Idaho Supreme Court Justice Roger Burdick is here. And of course, we have the longtime friend of the Frank Church Institute, Mayor David Beter. Let me call your attention to the back of your program about the award. And I quote, the Frank and Bethine Church Award for Public Service honors the achievements of two of Idaho's stellar leaders, Frank Church and Bethine Clark Church, represent America's greatest generation who devoted their lives to public service. This award honors those men and women whose unique qualities and contributions to public service exemplify the legacy of Frank and Bethine Church. Tonight we honor another distinguished recipient of the award at a time of the establishment of the new School of Public Service under the leadership of Boise State University President Bob Kustra. As most of you know, Bob and Kathy Kustra have been in public service for much of their lives. Bob as a state legislator and lieutenant governor of Illinois, and Kathy is a congressional staff member and state health care official. We appreciate their continued service at Boise State for the past 12 years, and we hope they will be here for many more. Dr. Kessler. There goes, there goes a microphone. Well, good evening and welcome. This is just such an incredible event. Uh, the 32nd Annual Frank Church Conference. Over the years, it has grown and grown. Uh, primarily, I would argue, since Kathy and I came to Idaho too late uh, to get to know Frank Church because of that force of nature known as Bethine Church. Uh, she made sure 
that this institute and all of its work and Gary's work was primary in the work of Boise State University. Uh, it's, a, it's really a fitting tradition that the Frag Church Institute has played such a critical role in internationalizing our campus. There's just no question that it has allowed our students, our faculty, members of the community to meet diplomats, public officials, people from all over the world who've come here over the years to learn more about what is going on, not just around us regionally, but globally as well. And as Gary said, it fits in so nicely with our new School of Public Service, which we established last year. Uh, the plan there was quite simple. We saw eroding public confidence of government, public officials, too many people trumpeting the disregard of the public service, and it was time to bring together the various parts of our academic community that are engaged with teaching and doing research in the public service together in the school of public service, to lift the public service the way we need to lift it today more than ever before. And I can't think, across the great state of Idaho, of two people that could serve as such perfect models to our students of what public service is all about. Frank Church and this man over here, Cecil Andrus. It says it all. And by the way, we have some students here. Could I ask the students to stand, if, please? Those from the School of Public Service and our ROTC students, thank you for joining us today. You honor us by your presence here. As I said earlier, the School of Public Service is really all about teaching all of our students across this growing campus of ours the importance of not only thinking and acting regionally, but thinking and acting globally. And that's precisely what we are going to be doing here. Some of you are aware of the Frank and Bethine Church Chair. We are currently in the process of searching this land for a scholar and a practitioner of the public service who can come and join us on this campus. It's my understanding the board is actually in the middle of a fundraising campaign for that. So there's my duty to the board. I've mentioned it now. And you all know there is a fundraising campaign for that chair going on. Uh, we also have a PhD in public policy here that's part of the School of Public Service, and uh, it joins a growing number of PhD programs we have on this campus. And with that, I must mention that just last week, the Carnegie Foundation informed uh, those of us at Boise State University that we are being reclassified, and we are now a doctoral research university, a goal we've sought for many years. Congratulations to the faculty and the staff for getting us there. Now, I had the pleasure of sitting down for a half an hour and interviewing Secretary Panetta uh, before Christmas in anticipation of his visit here and the opportunity uh, to spend a little time with him. So uh, he's going to do all the talking tonight, and I can't wait. But I will tell you one story about him that I think is really important. Now, those of you that have read uh, the, the, the book, you, you know about uh, this, but it's so important. Now, I know that for those of you who tracked my academic background with a PhD in political science, you'd probably think I'd zero in on some high policy decision that was going on during the time he was CIA director, secretary of defense. But what impressed me the most, and what impresses Kathy and I, by the way, about Idaho is how we all love dogs. Whether you have them or not, <laughs> dogs are an important part of our lives here in this state. And you can measure a man or a woman by the way they treat their dogs, okay? So those of you that read the book, you know where I'm going with this. This is a worthy fight. So there was this dog, and unfortunately he's passed on, but his name was Bravo, and he was the secretary's dog. This dog had access to the highest level decision-making in the United States government. He sat amongst the most powerful men and women in this world. And he listened to their decision-making and how they were gonna carry out their duties. 
And as the secretary says, so this is his line, not mine, not once did Bravo give anything away. <laughs> well, when I got to that part of the book, I knew I had to finish it because this is the kind of guy you just want to hang out with in spite of all of this incredible record of achievement in government. He's just a great guy who appreciates where he's come from and where he's gone over his incredible life. We here at Boise State know something about that as we have accepted refugees from across the country into our university. And by the way, there's some sitting at that table right back there. And, and here you're about to hear the son of an Italian immigrant who's going to speak to you today from the highest councils of American national government. What a day for America. Thank you, Secretary Panetta, for joining us today. And uh, now let me introduce Larry LaRocco, another former Frank Church staff member and board member of the Frank Church Institute. He also served with uh, tonight's award recipient in Congress. While Larry is well known to most of us, you may not know that he studied foreign policy at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. He served as president of the U.S. Association of Former Members of Congress, and he established a study group with Iran. He also co-chairs the Congress to Campus program, which will bring a program to Boise State this spring. Please welcome Congressman LaRocco. Thank you, Gary. And Gary was my chief of staff when I was in Congress. And you did well, Gary. Thank you very much. I, uh, it's a great privilege and personal uh, bit of honor for me tonight to introduce to you the 2016 recipient of the Frank and Bethine Church Award for Public Service, the Honorable Leon Panetta. I welcome my former colleague and friend from the U.S. House of Representatives to Idaho and to the Frank Church Institute at Boise State University. The Frank Church Institute, has been mentioned, is now housed in the new College of Public Service, so it is indeed appropriate to recognize the five decades of extraordinary public service of a talented statesman who has provided leadership at so many levels of our government. As an American, I know Leon Panetta as Mr. Secretary and Mr. Director. As a congressional colleague, I know Leon Panetta as Mr. Chairman, or Leon. Whatever the title, I am one fortunate person to be able to call Leon Panetta my friend. Given the task of introducing our special guests, it is all too tempting to merrily recite in chronological order the enormous accomplishments of this rare and talented public servant. For at the end of the day, it's not the time and tenure and service that is the apt descriptor and measure of the person, but it's the core values and that we applaud, sing, salute, and celebrate. Leon Panetta is from the central coast of California. In many respects, he never strayed from the very property and walnut grove his immigrant father settled. His rural immigrant roots shaped his common sense and profound love of country values. His parents ran a popular Italian restaurant in Carmel, and it was in that gathering place, surrounded by family, he began his working life. His family work ethic, Catholic faith, love of dogs, <laughs> enormous capacity for laughter, laser-like focus on mission, humility, devotion to flag and family, are simply embedded in his DNA. In the 1960s, he attended Santa Clara University, not far from his home, turned his bachelor's and law degrees with distinction. He served in the United States Army as a military intelligence officer, worked for a moderate GOP U.S. senator who was his mentor, and he met the love of his life, Sylvia, while working in Washington, D.C. 
Senator Thomas Kekel was a true mentor and devoted public service who looked for compromise and believed morality and politics were not mutually ex exclusive. After Kekel's defeat, Leon worked in the Nixon administration and HEW on civil rights responsible for the integration of hundreds of schools in the South. Eventually, the Nixon White House demanded he derail those integration efforts for raw political reasons. Leon resigned in protest and immediately switched parties. He went home, as he always did, to his beloved Carmel to practice law, and he won a seat in Congress in 1976, which he comfortably held for 16 years. I don't think he ever got below 61%. I want to get personal for just a minute. As a newly elected U.S. representative in 1991, speaking of myself, I want to say that Frank Church had always been my political mentor and my model for political behavior. I screened the horizon of my new 434 colleagues for those who loved the institution, carried themselves with distinction, and were true workhorses, not show horses, who were devoted to their constituents and country. I searched for alignment with members who were truth seekers and truth tellers. Based on those criteria, I quickly found Leon Panetta. If you'll recall for a minute, in early 1991, the Congress was faced with a vote to authorize military action in Kuwait. It was Desert Storm. The vote came literally days after I was sworn into the 102nd Congress. During my attendance at every military and intelligence briefing, I met Leon Panetta. We are both proud Italian Americans, former U.S. Army military intelligence officers, had both attended Catholic universities, and were deeply skeptical of becoming mired in a protracted war like Vietnam. When the vote came, we both supported more sanctions and more diplomacy and opposed the military action. We were on the losing side, but it was a vote of conscience, and possibly I was putting my job on the line only a few weeks after being sworn in. And then the federal budget issue quickly put us back in the same orbit. I was strongly committed to the Deficit Hawk Caucus, and that led me immediately back to Leon Panetta, the chairman of the House Budget Committee. As a fervent fiscal conservative, he constantly briefed any group or caucus on the intricacies of the federal budget and the dangers of burgeoning deficits. I can still picture that younger man, 25 years ago, carrying a large accordion folder of reports and charts, the ultimate nerd, oh, the charts he had. He had all these charts, the ever-present pie charts, these damn charts, they showed how narrow our choices were, showing the slice of the pie that we paid in interest every year in the national debt, the small slice of the pie our nation spent on discretionary programs, and the large slice of the pie on non-discretionary locked-in programs. He was a one-man wonky crusader for fiscal sanity. <laughs> I listened and learned. He sought the facts and told the facts. It was clear that neither the tooth fairy or a constitutional amendment would balance the budget. Only congressional action would reach that goal. Too many are still hiding behind the demagoguery of a constitutional amendment instead of making the hard choices. Budgets may seem dry and arcane to some, but they are all really a statement of priorities and values, when you really think about it. And for Leon Panetta, budget deficits were crippling America. And for him, the raw numbers showed we could not afford to deal with the country's inequality on our current upward trajectory of deficits. He was convinced the money squandered on annual interest payments could be used to help the poor and kickstart opportunity for all Americans. Those were his priorities, but the deficits were the obstacle to our country's living up to its true potential. This was a man on a mission. Leon continued his crusade for fiscal sanity while director of the OMB, a position he assumed in early 1993 after leaving the House. As he writes in his wonderful book that Bob has talked about, Worthy Fights, and I quote Leon Canetta, I played a role in the effort to balance the federal budget under President Clinton. 
The challenges were immense and the divisions deep. To shrink and then eliminate the federal budget, we proposed raising taxes, a middle class tax cut, an energy tax, and social programs. But here's the thing, he said, no one got everything they wanted in that package and some of those who supported it paid a price, unquote. I supported that budget and paid the price in 1994 after we passed the budget in the House by one vote. But I believed then and I still believe today it was the right thing to do. From his perch at OMB, Leon became chief of staff to President Clinton where he brought discipline and organization to a White House and he continued to forge bonds with the Congress. Leon Panetta's core belief in transparency and communication between the branches of government has served as well as citizens and the functioning of the agencies he led with distinction. As you recall, President Obama tapped him to be director of the troubled CIA in 2009. He was quickly confirmed unanimously by the U.S. Senate and applied his leadership skills to the CIA frozen with internal morale issues and negative perceptions by the public. His strong sense of transparency with the Congress forged strong relationships with a needed ally. And he demonstrated to the vast CIA network of professionals he was fully committed to the U.S. intelligence mission and would fight for that mission. Bin Laden, Laden was located and killed during his watch. Only when Director Panetta created an internal team at the CIA solely dedicated to Bin Laden's demise did the successful operation in Pakistan occur. He demanded weekly briefings on the progress of finding Bin Laden and was relentless in that quest. And then, from that relatively small agency, Leon Panetta then moved to lead the nation's largest organization, the Department of Defense, as secretary. The department governs two million under uniform and one million civilians, three million people. Think for a minute about the rampant dysfunctionality of Congress and then consider that Leon Panetta was confirmed by the United States Senate on a vote of 100 to zero. The vote is testament to the respect and our honoree holds with the entire political spectrum. His knowledge of budgets, organizational leadership, and priorities led the DOD through an enormous era of change as he wound down the war in Afghanistan, confronted Al Qaeda and ISIS, ended Don't Ask, Don't Tell, addressed sexual harassment and assaults in the military, maintained vital weapon systems, and also made certain that women were fully integrated into our defense apparatus. He did that. <laughs> William Sapphire's political dic dictionary uses as shorthand for Potomac fever the phrase, they never come back to Pocatello. <laughs> this was coined by former Senator Richard Neuberger from Oregon in his book, Adventures in Politics. When you think about that, let us remind ourselves that Bethine came home to Boise. Richard Stallings is back in Island Park. Jim and Louise McClure came back. Orville and June Hansen are back in Idaho. Cease and Carol never really left, just for those four short years, and he never took his watch off Idaho time. And Chris and I live in Boise. And Leon and Sylvia Panetta are back on the walnut farm in the Carmel Valley after that distinguished career. Some of us never left home or forget our roots. Certainly that is the case with Leon Panetta who has led an incredible life of public service at the highest levels while he never abandoned coastal California or his core values. And we should not ignore the wonderful symmetry of the lives of giant political partners like Bethine and Frank Church and Leon and Sylvia Panetta. Both couples are true partners in lifelong public service. Leon, please let Sylvia know that your friends and admirers here in Idaho appreciate her lifelong commitment to public service and the work you both do at the Panetta Institute for Public Policy that is literally changing the lives of so many young Americans.
We are truly grateful to your partnership. I would now like to present to you a man who epitomizes public service and devotion to country and family. A man who has a monster of a sense of humor and whose whole body just shakes and quakes when he laughs as he does so often. A truth-seeking and truth-telling individual who will, I am sure, in his remarks, employ occasional profanity as if you are hearing poetry. <laughs> So the Frank Church Institute grants this award, and I want to read the inscription on it. Gary's going to give that to me. It says, the Frank and Bethine Church Award for Public Service presented to the Honorable Leon E. Panetta in grateful recognition of his service as U.S. Secretary of Defense and Director of the Central Intelligence Agency today, January 18, 2016. So Leon, if you come up, I'd like to present this to you and then let you have, give us some remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Larry, good friend and uh, former colleague, and really, really appreciate uh, the friendship that we've had over the years. Uh, I always found it a little difficult to think that there was a Larocco from Idaho. Uh, but I'm glad you believe in affirmative action and uh, you were able to get him there. Uh, I want to uh, thank Rick Clawson for his generosity uh, and uh, allowing me to be here. Gary and uh, Dr. Kustra, thank you very much for, uh, for a great interview. Really enjoyed it. And thanks for mentioning Bravo. I really appreciate that as well. He was a, he was a very dear friend and a colleague, and those of you that have golden retrievers know that uh, there is unconditional love uh, when it comes from a dog, and it was nice to have him. He's, as a matter of fact, he is in my portraits at both the CIA and the Defense Department. <laughs> And uh, they asked me about that, and I said, you know, Harry Truman said, if you want a friend in Washington, get a dog. And that's what I did. Uh, I want to express my, uh, my deepest thanks to all of you for this uh, wonderful award. I had the honor of uh, knowing both Frank Church and Bethine. Uh, I had the honor of uh, being able to work uh, with Senator Church uh, when he was senator. Uh, and on a number of issues. And as all of you know, uh, you, don't, you didn't work with Frank without dealing with Bethine. Uh, after he had passed away, uh, Bethine called me to ask me to come up and, uh, and give a speech at the Institute. And I said, you know, this, it's really tough to do. And she just came on like gangbusters. And I said, I got to do this <laughs> otherwise. I'm not going to be around very long. As an Italian, I have to worry about that. So, uh, she, was, uh, she was a wonderful partner. And the fact is that when you think about both of them uh, and their lives and their dedication to what this country is all about, uh, it is a contrast from the brutal and crazy politics that we see today. Uh, the fact was that Senator Church believed deeply in the greatness of America, the greatness of America both here and abroad. He believed deeply that in this country we could protect our security and protect our freedoms at the same time. He believed deeply in preserving the beautiful natural beauty that you have in the state and around the country. 
He was a consummate conservationist. And both he and Bethine believe deeply in advancing the rights of all, the rights of all Americans, a theme that we all remind ourselves of on this Martin Luther King Day. Most of all, they believed in the American dream. And in many ways, I've had the privilege of living that dream. As pointed out, uh, I'm the son of Italian immigrants. Uh, my father was the 13th in his family. And he had several brothers who came to America, as was the, was the case with many families. His brother, brothers came over ahead of him. And his brother Bruno wound up in Sheridan, Wyoming. And he had another brother, Tony, who wound up in California. So when my parents came to this country, uh, the tradition was you visit your older brother first. So they went to uh, Sheridan and spent one winter up there. <laughs> and my, my mother said, I think it's time to visit your other brother <laughs> in California. Which they did, and uh, my dad made it to uh, Monterey and opened up a restaurant uh, in Monterey during the war years. And my earliest recollections, I mean, you know, my parents worked hard and they expected the family to work hard. My earliest recollections were standing on a chair in the back of that restaurant washing glasses. My parents believed child labor was a requirement uh, in our family. Uh, and then uh, after the war, he sold the restaurant, and bought a farm in Carmel Valley, planted a walnut orchard, and again, my brother and I were expected to, to work there to move the irrigation pipes, to do the work, do the hoeing. Uh, and uh, as the walnut trees grew taller, my father would go around in those days with a pole and hook and shake each of the branches. And my brother and I would be underneath collecting the walnuts. When I got elected to Congress, my father said, uh, you know, you've been well-trained to go to Washington <laughs> because you've been dodging nuts all your life, <laughs> which was true. I, uh, I used to ask my father why he traveled all of that distance to come to this country. And, uh, you know, I've, I've been to my parents' hometown in Italy and, uh, you know, it, it was a poor area of Italy, but they had the comfort of family. They had people around them. Everything they knew was there. Why would you pick up, this is the early 30s, why would you pick up, leave everybody you knew, leave your family to go to a strange land? And my father said something that I've never forgotten, which was that the reason was because your mother and I believed we could give our children a better life in this country, which is the American dream. It's what all of us want for our children and hopefully what they will want for their children as well. The ability to be able to enjoy that dream of a better life. But my parents also taught me that dreams are just dreams, unless you're willing to work for it, unless you're willing to roll up your sleeves, unless you're willing to sacrifice, unless you're willing to fight in order to make sure that those dreams come true. I, had, I once had a, uh, a Jesuit at Santa Clara University, uh, where I went to undergrad law school, who said to me, uh, you know, Leon, understand that God may have given you life, but it's really up to you to make life worthwhile. And to do that, you gotta fight. And he backed it up with a story that I often tell because it makes the point of the uh, rabbi and the priest who decided that they would get to know each other a little better by going to events. So they would go to different events and talk with each other and learn about each other's faith. So one night, 
they decided to go to a boxing match. And just before the bell rang, one of the boxers made the sign of the cross. The rabbi nudged the priest and said, what does that mean? The priest said, it doesn't mean a damn thing if he can't fight. <laughs> and I, you know, typical Jesuit. Uh, <laughs> the fact is, we often bless ourselves with the hope that everything is going to be fine in this country. But it doesn't mean a damn thing unless we're willing to fight for it. And those are the values that I was raised with, and those are the values that all of us have, because they're the values of this country. Values of common sense and understanding and hard work and sacrifice. Values that made this the greatest country on earth. And whether or not we, we embrace those values will in many ways tell us whether or not America remains the greatest country on earth in the future. We're in 2016. And in many ways, I think we're at kind of a crossroads in which this country could probably go in one of two ways. I honestly believe that we could have an American Renaissance in the 21st century. That this could be a country with a strong economy that relies on the tremendous innovation and creativity that is so much a part of what gives us strength in our economy and the kind of creativity and innovation, you don't find that much around the world. It is intrinsic to who we are. The ability to have an educated workforce of young people who can join the workforce of the 21st century and have the skills necessary for the 21st century. To have a disciplined budget. To have a society in which everyone has the opportunity to succeed. To have a strong infrastructure, which is so important to a strong economy. To have the kind of trade that we need in a global world to have a strong, it can be a lean national defense, but an agile national defense for the future that remains the strongest on earth, that can support world leadership in a troubled world. We can have that kind of America. Or we could have an America in decline, an America in which our governing democracy is dysfunctional, in which it is gripped by partisan gridlock, in which neither party wants to work with the other to be able to resolve issues, a country in which we operate by crisis after crisis, a country in which we're unable to protect our most basic freedoms, our economy, our national security. What path we take will be determined by how we govern ourselves or how we fail to govern ourselves. I often tell the students at our institute, and the purpose of our, of our institute, Panetta Institute, is to try to inspire young people to get involved in public life to give something back to this country, which I think goes to the heart and soul of what democracy is all about. And I often tell the students there that in a democracy, we govern either by leadership or by crisis. If leadership is there and willing to take the risks associated with leadership, and make no mistake about it, if you want to lead, you've got to take risks whether you're in business or whether you're in, in public policy, whether you're in elective office, 
If you're going to lead, you've got to take risks. That's the nature of it. And if you're willing to take those risks, you can avoid crisis and certainly contain crisis in the future. But if leadership is not there, then make no mistake about it, we will govern by crisis. And too often today, we govern by crisis. And look, I was in elective office. In some ways, it's easier to govern by crisis. You don't have to make any tough decisions, don't have to raise any taxes, don't have to cut any programs, just wait for crisis. And when crisis gets so bad, you blame the crisis. You can govern that way. But let me tell you, there's a price to be paid for that. And the price is that you lose the trust of the American people in our system of governing. And in a democracy, trust is everything. I've, in 50 years of public life, I've seen Washington at its best, and I've seen Washington at its worst. I mean, the good news is that I've seen Washington work. When I went back as a legislative assistant, there were the Frank Churches of the world. There were Clifford Case from New Jersey, Jacob Javits from New York, Hubert Humphrey, Dick Russell, Henry Jackson, Warren Magnuson, Mark Hatfield, Republicans, Democrats. Did they have their political differences? Of course. Did they fight each other in elections? You bet. But when it came to major issues facing this country, they worked together. They worked together. And as a result, landmark legislation was passed, which made this country stronger for the future. And it's not easy. It's tough to do. When I got elected to Congress, it was the same thing. Tip O'Neill was the Speaker of the House. Bob Michael was the Minority Leader. Tip O'Neill was a Democrat's Democrat. But when it came to issues that affected the country, whether it was a Republican president or a Democratic president, they worked together to deal with those issues. I can remember Tip, when we were dealing with budget issues, he put us in a room and said, you're not coming out of that room till you get a deal. Republicans or Democrats, you're in that room and you're not coming out till you get a deal. And you know what? Everything was on the table. Everything. That's how we got budget deals. Tough to do. That was incredibly important to the leadership of both sides was to govern. And you know what? They thought governing was good politics. They thought governing was good politics. <laughs> Today, I've, at least in my lifetime, have never seen Washington as badly tied up in gridlock and partisanship in the inability to deal with some of the most important issues facing this country. And look, both parties bear responsibility. The inability to come together, the inability to be able to compromise. And as a result of that, important issues facing this country, whether it's a budget debt of $19 trillion, whether it's immigration reform, energy policy, education policy, authority for the president to conduct a war, all of which is going nowhere right now. Those are the issues that have to be dealt with. I remember Teddy Roosevelt once said that when faced with a tough decision, the best thing you can do is to make the right decision. <laughs> the next best thing you can do is to make the wrong decision. But the worst thing you can do is to do nothing, to do nothing. And too often, that's what happens. Look, leadership by crisis is no way to run a country. And very frankly, it is no way to deal with a dangerous world. 
We're living at a time when there's a series of flashpoints in the world. I did a lecture series at the uh, Panetta Institute a couple years ago, focusing on 100 years from 1914 to 2014, and some of the changes that had occurred. But as we looked at the situation at the time, 1914, there were a lot of flashpoints in the world, some of them similar to what we see today. Terrorism, nationalism, fragile alliances, territorial disputes, and leadership in the world that didn't quite recognize how these flashpoints could get out of control and create a world war. I'm not naive. There are a lot of differences, obviously, between 1914 and 2014 and the time we live now. But I do think that we can learn from history because the reality is that we are facing a series of those kinds of flashpoints in the world. We're fighting a war on terrorism. We're fighting ISIS, which threatens our own country and other countries in the world. We're facing chaos in the Middle East with failed states, a situation that can be exploited by Shias and Sunnis and Islamic extremists. We continue to deal with a nation like Iran while we hope that ultimately the agreement on nuclear arms can create a new relationship for the future. The concern is that there's still a country that supports terrorism throughout the Middle East and creates instability. We're dealing with North Korea and their nuclear ambitions. We're dealing with a Russia and Putin who have brought us to a new chapter in the Cold War with what's happening in both Syria and the Ukraine. We're dealing with China, and while we have a strong economic relationship with China, the fact is that they're also making territorial claims in the South China Sea. And we're also dealing with the threat, what I think is probably the battlefield of the future, which is cyber. And the potential in cyber to virtually use cyber in order to cripple this country, to take down our power grid, take down our chemical systems, our water systems, take down our government systems, our financial systems. That reality is there. That reality is there. So we're facing a number of flashpoints. And all of this is occurring at a time when there are questions. Questions about whether or not we will continue to provide world leadership, questions about whether we'll have the resources to invest in our economy and in our security, whether or not we can govern ourselves. I think it's important to learn the lessons of history, to be flexible and adaptive to a changing world, to not get trapped by the mistakes of the past, it's important to be cautious. It's important to use diplomacy. But it's also important to be clear and decisive when it comes to protecting this country. Churchill once said, if we open a quarrel between the past and the present, we shall find that we have lost the future. If the US does not provide strong world leadership in dealing with these challenges, nobody else will. I believe in American leadership. I believe in it because throughout our history, leadership has responded. When we faced recessions and depressions and world wars and natural disasters, we've always had leadership to deal with these challenges. Why? Because the fundamental strength of this country lies in the spirit and resilience and common sense and values of the American people. As Secretary of Defense, I saw those values in the men and women that served this nation in uniform. When I would go to the battlefields of Iraq and Afghanistan, 
and look at these young people in the eye. These are men and women that are willing to put their lives on the line, that are willing to fight and die for this country. And surely if there are those who are willing to fight and die for this country, it isn't too much to ask our elected leadership to find a little bit of that courage in order to govern this country.